it's a great pleasure to be here and a great pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, I've known many of you for many, many years, and it's really nice to see you all in one place, particularly wh when there's a time and a need uh, that, that, uh, that uh, we develop new ideas. So as Harry introduced, I'm from Sony Computer Entertainment. I should make it very clear uh, that uh, I work for PlayStation, and I, I do work. Uh, <laughs> it's not at all playing games. So uh, yes, we do the games consoles. So um, I'm going to talk through, uh, if you can go to the next slide. Um, first of all, to, to, to give a perspective of industry, particularly the electronics sector here, because that's where I'm from, I, and apologies, I, I'm, I can't speak to the other sectors. Uh, we're going to talk through um, how we see the secular economy framework um, affecting us in future. Uh, next of all, to look at what, what in, as industry uh, we see uh, our concerns, but also what are opportunities coming out of this. And then to segue into, okay, what, what is the relevance for the scientific perspective for us here? What, what is the relevance of this field of industrial ecology? Um, so basically, um, here, here this, this diagram intends uh, to show the framework as it sort of affects the electronic supply chain. There are a lot of issues, a lot of uh, ideas within the circular economy package, but effectively it splits into, into two tracks uh, that have major influence on our sector. Um, and that all comes under the package. So first of all, if we look towards uh, the waste side, we've been talking about waste, how to make waste useful. The main area of waste as it affects our sector comes under the waste uh, directive, the Waste Framework Directive, and that's now under revision. Um, and under that Waste Framework Directive, there are plans to do things in relation to producer responsibility, namely to harmonize aspects of how producer responsibility works in practice. And producer responsibility is um, implemented through various other directives for waste electronics, for automobiles, for packaging, and for batteries in Europe. So there's a plan here to have hard mandatory requirements coming under the Waste Framework Directive. So on the other track, you know, the intention is that we should do something to develop better products, products which are maybe longer lasting or easier to repair or recycle. And that comes under, for our sector, the Energy Related Products Directive. And I think our sector's unique in this respect because other sectors don't have a, an eco-design directive. We do. So in that case, we become something of a test bed for those type of design measures. And again, uh, that comes in on a sort of sector-specific level. So y we end up with different regulations for, or different requirements for different types of products, whether that's TVs or printers or games consoles. And um, so right now, Senelec are drafting up some uh, efficiency standards. We have the pleasure to have Cesar Santos here with us today from the Commission, and he's presiding over that process here, so he can share his uh, experiences. But um, out of that should come a, a set of uh, standards um, for different aspects of circular economy, which can be applied to the different sectors under that um, framework directive. And right now, the first in the front line of this, we have uh, displays, not yet regulated, but there will be a number of circular economy requirements being spearheaded in the draft directive there. We see some proposals for servers and enterprise equipment, and oh look, my servers look flashing lights. Uh, that's clever. Um, <laughs> and actually, uh, I'm proud to say, and when I mean looking at it, uh, games consoles, I think, are actually the first. Because as part of, we, we made a voluntary agreement again with Mr. Santos on the energy efficiency of games consoles. And Mr. Santos said at the end of that, we really need to see some things on circular economy in your proposal. So we, we made some commitments to circular economy, and that's already in effect. So. Um, that's why we're also interested in this because we're already involved and we have to review that in 2017. So we have, if you like, uh, two tracks and the circular economy package certainly, I think, has uh, major impact and, and major involvement of the electronics industry because we're the first really to have to engage on the eco-design side of things. Okay, so what does industry see about this? And industry has been very cautious. You know, industry's not really said a lot. There's been a lot of discussion, and industry's kind of been a bit quiet, a bit nervous, a bit not sure. Um, so, but I think as in January, we actually put a position together within the trade association Digital Europe. So I thought the best way to reflect certainly that aspect of industry was to basically provide a summary of what industry think. 
Uh, first of all, the good news is the industry see quite a lot of opportunities coming out of the circular economy package. First of all, there's a drive towards having harmonized design requirements. So we know that there has to be some regulation of design and we know that there's going to be some progress. So the best thing is that it's harmonized. The worst thing is that you have all these different requirements in all these different countries and you have to work all of that out and some of them are conflicting. So it's very nice that the circular economy package will bring some level of harmonization to that. Um, also, there's quite a considerable support uh, within the package for innovation and research and investment. So as we know, there are lots of uncertainties. So the fact the package has this uh, investment and funds available is very helpful. Also, we see on the waste side, there's a lot of illegal uh, waste shipment, a lot of waste going to developing countries where it isn't necessarily treated to the right standards. Um, and there's some focus on there on trying to prevent this outpouring of waste materials, which helps us with our producer responsibility targets. We also see an effort to finally try to link together and ensure that producer responsibility delivers some incentives that help us to design better products. There's a proposal that the fees that we pay to producer responsibility systems should be variated or differentiated based upon real cost of recycling so that we have an influence to the design side. We also see a proposal that there should be common rules for recycling systems for different sectors so that they're all operating according to the same sort of requirements. Right now, it's a huge administration for companies to deal with so many different recycling schemes with so many different bureaucratic rules, which doesn't have any benefit for the environment or the economy. It's just uh, different bureaucracies. We also see a requirement to improve the accuracy of data on waste flows. That's also very helpful. We need to have the same data set. We need to know how we're progressing. And also, in, and very importantly, we see an initiative to help boost markets for secondary materials. And that's really needed to kickstart the whole thing. How do we get these materials back in the loop? I would not say open or closed, just how do we get more uh, recycling where it's appropriate? Okay. However, there are some issues. Um, so we do have some concerns, um, of course. So there's an idea that, of course, products should be made longer lasting. How do we measure that, particularly for longer lasting products? How do we measure that a product would last on average 10, 15 years? Um, what would consumers think if we communicated an average lifetime of eight years and suddenly the product stopped working after six years? So the more we look at that, the more we see it pushes towards extended warranty. Um, so there's a complexity there. What about products that consumers don't want to keep for eight years and they get rid of at three years? We waste our materials on making it last and being more engineered and more durable, but then it's thrown away. So how do we get this uh, sense of durability of the product? And how do we manage the consumer expectation regarding the lifetime of their product? Now the other side on the proposals for um, repair and reuse so that we should make our spare parts available to anybody that wants, our schematics, um, all of that stuff. Now, a lot of us have very proprietary technologies, very confidential technologies. We've developed these parts to be proprietary. We specifically don't sell them to anybody because they could use them to build new products. Um, but we do nevertheless provide them to repair companies who are authorized and can work to the right quality standards, the right safety standards. So we can do that and certainly at PlayStation, we, we're, we're unique in that we do an awful lot of out-of-warranty repair. We do offer repair and refurbishment services throughout the lifetime of our products. So we are supporting reuse, and there's a huge volume of reuse of our products, but we don't make those spare parts available. So there is a concern regarding liability and quality of repair and the freedom with which we want to provide all of our proprietary information and parts to the public. So that's another concern. Another concern is that design requirements on the front end uh, designed for circular economy are not necessarily linked to the issues that recyclers are bringing up at the back end. Um, I remember going to visit a recycling facility in the Netherlands uh, that were disassembling TVs and I was saying, okay, what about uh, design for disassembly? You know, how many screws? And they had this circular saw and they went, well, we're not really sure, you know, they just <laughs> got the thing open. So um, the, the question is, when I spoke with the recycling community recently, he said, actually, the thing that really concerns us is we invest in this technology long term, long term to be able to recycle electronic products like CRTs. And then you guys go and stop producing these things and how do we get return on investment? How do we plan for the types of materials coming down the line? And if you go and look at what the technology companies are planning, they're now saying that these things, uh, these things that we think are so wonderful and advanced are going to be obsolete within two or three years. 
forget this. Uh, you know, we're going to have instead an artificial intelligence necklace that you can talk to and will project images on tables and all kind of things like this. So what are we going to do? Virtual reality headsets are coming as well. What are we going to do? How's the industry going to know uh, how to recycle this material and how does it need to be designed to be recyclable? It's in constant flux. Um, and finally, you know, there's talk about having a quantitative recyclability index. So I can sell this and say, hey, this is 50% recyclable, guys. You go and buy it and it can be 50% recycled. And what does that mean? You know, a recycler can look and go, apparently it's 50% recyclable, so that's okay. But um, I think what's more important is how can it be recycled? The qualitative information, you know, what are the guarantees? Okay, it uses which plastics? Uh, it uses which, you know, does it have mercury in? So we're more for, as an industry, those quali qualifying the recyclability of our products than quantifying up front, because that's really an unknown. So, okay, that's, uh, that's all of the policy perspective, what industry think. But now digging into the science side, one thing I've noticed is certainly um, if you look at a lot of policies, uh, a lot of the ideas originated from um, some research or other, or, you know, from the scientific community. An idea starts to be developed. And as the policy develops, there's usually an impact study or, you know, a review. And that's usually a group of consultants going and reading all the literature and then advising the regulators what to do. So... There is an interaction, actually, between research and policy that isn't necessarily um, obvious. Um, and then the policy then links to practice. We all have to comply with, with these laws. So there is actually an interaction between research, policy, and practice that we should observe. And I think a lot of the academics in the room have written a lot of influential papers that have gone on and have actually influenced policy in, in Europe. But there's never been a dialogue. It's just been everybody reading everything. Um, and now what would be really nice is if you could link that practice back in a closed loop to research. <laughs> okay. So here's an example, and this is a, this is a piece of research that I did along with uh, Luke here um, and, and with Reed uh, Lifset from Yale um, on how do we get better differentiation of recycling fees. And I'm not going to dwell on this, but um, if you look at this table, on the left you see the categories of waste electronics. We have small appliances, refrigerators, displays, and large domestic appliances. That's the kind of separation of waste as it exists at the collection points. When it's taken to the recyclers, and this, the, these, this is based upon real data here, not anything made up, um, the recycling companies had a different price list. You know, they said, okay, we see it as household appliances, PCs, laptops, mobile phones, servers, refrigerators have CFC refrigerant and propane refrigerants, LCDs can have mercury backlights or not, uh, or CRTs, and all of this is based upon treatment requirements. You know, you have to separate a TV for recycling, you have to treat, um, you know, CFC refrigerants or HCFC refrigerants differently than propane refrigerants. And if you were to drive with a truckload of these things to a recycler, they would charge you a different price. So look on the right here. If we take the, 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 the cost, these are real costs for UK. So this was a, what a compliance scheme was charging back in 2010, I think, um, no, 2012, um, for the four different categories of waste. Nine pounds per tonne for small appliances, 57 pounds per tonne for refrigerators, 94 pounds a tonne for displays, and you've got 45 pounds a tonne revenue for LDA. This excludes logistics costs. Logistics costs may be 50 pounds per tonne. Now look, if you look at the actual price recyclers would pay for these things, the actual value, if you have a mobile phone, it's worth £700 a tonne. Now none of that is appearing in the waste stream, it's too valuable. But if it were, it's worth £700 a tonne. So one question, why is my friend here, Mr Holmquist at Sony Mobile, paying anything? This is a valuable material, why is he being penalised for producing something that is really recyclable and doesn't even appear in the waste? Um, why are the companies that are producing LCDs with mercury-free backlights paying to treat the ones that contain the mercury or the CRTs? It, that can be recycled the same as computers. So here's the flaw with produce responsibility. Everything is becoming average. Everything is easy for everything to become average. But there should be a better accounting. There should be better accountability. And that's where we come in and we're supporting the, 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 the recycling schemes and the policies to support the allocation of real costs of recycling uh, to the different types of materials within the waste. Now, that's complicated in its own right. But I wanted to show this data to show the example um, of how, when you take an industrial ecology perspective, it can inform the practice. 
Okay, so industrial ecology doesn't just look at British responsibility. I went and looked at all the back issues of the Journal of Industrial Ecology for the last few years, and I found a huge array of topics. Business models, strategies, waste management, new technology, sustainable cities, life cycle assessment, footprinting, energy efficiency, industrial symbiosis, remanufacturing, consumer behavior. All of them um, have leading edge research on these topics. Um, so it's a huge array of things that industrial ecology is talking about. And what's very interesting is, look at the circular economy package. It includes very similar words, very similar ideas, very similar proposals. And it occurred to me, therefore, that the industrial ecology community could help and could add science to the current uh, range of proposals in the package. Okay, so basically, um, how? Why is... Uh, industrial ecology useful. As we've said, you know, it can bring a very robust and credible scientific approach to this area, something that's currently missing. It's all very theoretical. We get lost. We have a lot of uncertainties. It takes a systems perspective. So we don't just look at one thing or another. We think, what is the impact on the whole system? It's leading edge. There's a lot of leading edge researchers involved, and it's interdisciplinary, bringing expertise from different areas. So that is why this is useful today. How is it useful? Well, we can proceed with an, analys an analysis based on evidence and data rather than hypothesis and assumption. It asks the right questions. It's not afraid to address areas of where you have unexpected results. Hey, that's not what we expected to see happen. So that's interesting. Let's look at that. It doesn't run away from those things that aren't expected. And it then also can account for complex trade-offs. What about if it's good for recycling but not good for climate change? It, has, it, can, it can give a view on that. Okay, so to conclude and take time for coffee, um, basically w the, the EU, EU circular economy does impact electronics in particular, so there's a strong interest in electronics companies. There are significant opportunities for industry, but there are big impacts that can't be ignored, and industry has not spoken up enough about those issues that they have. And finally, industrial ecology can bring a scientific approach, a much more scientific approach than has existed to date. <laughs>